Hello, this is Father Gregory Pine, joining you again here on the Thomistic Institute podcast, as has become our bi-weekly custom. We're following up with one of the presenters who has spoken at a Thomistic Institute university campus or Thomistic Institute you know, intellectual retreat or conference as a way by which to continue the conversation and to ask those questions which may have been left unasked on account of the fact that time is limited and we as human beings can only ask so many questions before we have to go to bed. So I'm very delighted uh, today to be joined by Dr. Nina Harriman. So thanks so much for joining today, Dr. Harriman. Thank you for having me, Father Gregory. Hey, it's my joy. So many of our listeners will be familiar with you and your work on the basis of the lectures that you've given for the Thomistic Institute. But for those who don't know you, would you just say a word of introduction, who you are, where you're from, what you're currently working on? So my name is, as you already said, Nina Herrmann. I'm from Germany, as you will pick up from my accent. Um, I was born and brought up in Germany, originally trained to become a lawyer, but shortly after the bar exam experienced um, kind, of, kind of a, I was always born a, a Catholic, but it was around the bar exam that my faith finally really came alive. So I was like an older vocation uh, and came alive through a deep encounter with the Lord through the scriptures. It was in the scriptures or listening to to real preachers preaching the word of God that I for the first time in my life, realized what it means that Christ is risen and that God is love and sends us his Holy Spirit. And that was so life transforming that I thought something is wrong with our church. I mean, it's not a secret that there's something wrong with the German church. And maybe had I looked across the border, I, <laughs> I would have had a different diagnosis. But, you know, here I was 27 years of age and thinking I've been a Sunday going Christian my entire life. And nobody ever preached the word of God to me. And here come these Indians. It was a retreat preached by Indian preachers who just do nothing but preaching the word of God for a week. And I encounter the risen Lord. So how do we get the word of God back into the church? <laughs> and uh, I was lucky to have a very, very good, um, holy, old spiritual director who basically invited me to risk my life and, uh, and follow the Lord's call to just leave behind everything and come. And so I um, was, after a couple of years, three years in active mission, I was sent to study theology by that same spiritual director who runs a great, re um, a, a big retreat house in Germany, um, studied philosophy first in Frankfurt with the Jesuits and then theology in Rome at the Gregorian. And then because of that decisive encounter with the word, word of God, I had decided to do my license at the Biblicum. Um, and there I met... With the Biblicum, I was allowed to go to Jerusalem and spend a semester at the glorious Ecole Biblique of your order. <laughs> it's uh, the boutique for studying scripture in the church, the oldest institute that the church has for studying scripture in a modern, exegetical way, founded by the uh, venerable Father Père Lagrange, Marie-Joseph Lagrange, who's in the process of beatification, hopefully. Um, and so I did. I was blessed, thanks to a very generous offer by the Ecole Biblique. I got a scholarship to do my doctorate in Jerusalem. And so I spent six years at the Ecole Biblique. And there I had, um, I was doing this in, in Cote d'Utel with your own university now in Fribourg. And so on one of my visits to Fribourg, I met a priest from the Diocese of San Francisco who suggested that I come to the United States to teach in the seminary in the United States. And that was not exactly on my radar, <laughs> but typically when you discern something, sometimes it's the thing that was not on your radar that is straight from the Lord. And um, given the situation in Germany as it is at the moment, um, I discerned uh, with my spiritual director that actually it seems to be uh, the Lord calling me to the United States. And I'll tell you something, I, I remember telling to my spiritual director, well, I have nothing to offer to the Americans. That's such a rich church compared to what's going on in Europe. And then he said, well, maybe the Lord wants to teach you something there. And I have to say, um, I have been taught a lot simply by teaching at St. Patrick's. That's where I am now for the last four years in St. Patrick's University, Seminary and University in Menlo Park in the heart of Silicon Valley in the beautiful Archdiocese of San Francisco. And yeah, so that's what I am now. I am uh, teaching scripture in a seminary and hoping to help these seminarians discover uh, the power and the beauty of the word of God so that 
the people who grow up in their parishes won't have the same won't have to wait till they're 27 to hear the word of god for the first time <laughs> amen well you managed to give an introduction that is at once evangelical and humble so i commend you for that for foregrounding the lord and his love uh, and the way in which he has been at work in your life so that's very it's very beautiful for me to hear um so I listened to the lecture that you gave on finding consolation in the book of Revelation, and I profited very much from it, so thank you for that. And I thought that we could just ask a few questions, follow-up questions, just to kind of pursue some of those thoughts a little further. And, you know, with the candid admission that I'm hoping that you'll speculate a little bit, because I'm always more comfortable in a zone of wild speculation, being a dogmatician myself. So um, I thought that the first pursuit that we could follow was this relationship between Scripture and history. And so you make reference in the lecture that the interpretation of the book of Revelation has been vexed on account of the fact that certain exegetes want to assign it rather strictly to a certain period, um, or they want to find its prophecies or prognostications, again, strictly associated with contemporary affairs. So when we approach the book, you know, the book of Revelation, and then we think about it in terms of its historical context, and the way that it shed light on our historical context. You as an exegete, um, you know, as a, as a biblical theologian, thinking about these things, what do you think are some good principles, maybe some, some good ways that we can approach the sacred text, conscious of its history, conscious of our history, and read it in a way from which, or, or read it in such a way that we, that we profit better from it without falling into kind of um, like overly facile explanations? Yeah, thank you. That's a brilliant question. I don't claim to have the full answer, but I can tell you what I apply for my own discernment. I think a key sentence that we always have to keep in mind um, is the last word of our Lord to the disciples when in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. And I think I mentioned that in the lecture. The disciples say to the Lord, is this the time when we are going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times that the Heavenly Father has appointed in his wisdom. I'm paraphrasing because I only know the citation in German. It's Acts chapter 1 verse 7, I think. Um, so the Lord is very clear. He does not want to give us um, exact times. Uh, on that date, I'm going to come back. Obviously, that would be um, spiritually very de 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 dangerous for us. Um, because this is exactly what the temptation of fortune tellers is, of astrologers, um, which the book of Deuteronomy tells us clearly is a direct breaching of the first commandment. Um, the act of faith is the exact opposite. Future belongs to the Lord. Uh, providence belongs to the Lord. And the Christian is asked every day to surrender in total trust to God's providence and not worry whether the word is going to end tomorrow because it doesn't really matter that much. What's important is that today, if the Lord comes to meet me today, I'm ready to face him and undergo my personal judgment, right? And so I think that's one of the reasons why the Lord is definitely not going to tell us the date when X, Y, and Z is going to happen. Now, you're asking about the, the this relationship between um, history and scripture, and I think we can learn a lot from the Old Testament, um, where we see that there is the people of Israel has to live certain moments in its actual history. It lives the exodus from the Egyptian slavery. It lives the moment of going through the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, whatever you want to, want to call it. And this historic moment then becomes paradigmatic for later moments in Israel's own life, so that when they find themselves in Babylon, they meditate and think about the return from the exile in the language and images of the first exile to the point that we meditate on the mystery of baptism in the light of the first exodus and the passing of the Red Sea. And something very similar is happening in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Revelation. The church undergoes this moment of intense persecution towards the end of the first century, that's what St. John is living with the seven churches whom he's writing to. And the church in her wisdom realizes or 
it might be a combination between the church and the visionary herself, himself. But I think what the Holy Spirit is really doing here is very, very much analogous to what happened in the Old Testament. The early church, the new people of God, is undergoing this historical moment of persecution. And that moment becomes paradigmatic for the entire time until the Lord returns. And so even the way then St. John depicts, and you know, when, when Jesus first appears to St. John, he says, I'm coming to show you what is and what is to come. So what is, is paradigmatic for what is to come. But then the way St. John is being shown what is to come is clearly not a chronological sequence of historic events, but even the way it's unfolded, these, you know, the, the seven, uh, seven angels, in uh, seven bowls and seven plagues and seven trumpets, all of that shows we're speaking about a symbolic language that depicts something that is not in chronological order, but in um, synchronic order and resists a decodification of um, historical events like would be the temptation of the millenarianists who believe that Jesus will come back and then reign from, for a thousand years on this earth, or like the typical Protestant um, of some Protestant evangelical approaches where they try to see, okay, now we have uh, the scorpions and that's the invention of the motorcycle or something like that. Um, rather, I think it's very important that as Christians, each and every one of us learn to live and read this book as applying to my historic moment in its entirety. So, thinking out loud here, uh, and kind of following up on the theme of like remembering and recognizing, it strikes me that there's a kind of connection here with the way that some philosophers will talk about anamnesis. Um, it's a kind of like recollection uh, whereby one recognizes him or herself in past events. And I've heard this mentioned recently in a couple of settings. So one was in a lecture that Father Anthony Jambroni gave at its Mystic Institute circle. Gosh, its Mystic Circle, got it. it's got to be like seven years ago now. But he was talking about the Lord's kind of recognition of himself in Israel's scriptures, which was a very fascinating thing. He ended the lecture with this line uh, that the rabbis, I guess this would be like 8th, ninth century rabbis, would ask the question, what the Messiah will do in paradise? And they said, he will read Torah. Um, and then I'm thinking also of... A certain something that I noticed recently in the Gospel of Luke, that whereas with Mark and with Matthew you have passion predictions, which are pretty straightforward, in Luke you have both like pre facto like uh, predictions and then post facto predictions. It's fascinating, like both on the road to Emmaus and then at the tomb with the angel, what has happened is brought back to the attention of the disciples. So maybe okay. So these are some scattered thoughts, but. I'm thinking about the way that the book of Revelation helps us as Christians to be recollected in the Lord's kind of apocalyptic designs, apocalyptic love designs, we might even say. Like, as you approach this text, um, and as you think of how the Lord has shown himself to be in the past, how he shows himself to be in the present, and how we can hope him to show himself to be in the future, like, what kind of resources does the text give us for like recalling, for remembering, for recollecting ourselves in the providence which you described? Um, tricky question, and I have to admit I haven't thought about it in the terms that you're putting it now. Um, you're absolutely right with, I think I, I want to go back to what you said, quoting Father Anthony Jambroni's talk and Jesus recognizing himself in the scriptures, that is a topic that is very, very prominent in the Gospel of Luke. Like, okay. if you if you look at Luke, and particularly the moment of the transfiguration, how you have um, Moses and Elijah appearing to Jesus, and it becomes very clear that Elijah and Moses stand symbolically for the Torah and the prophets. And it's mm -hmm. as if, and then they speak about Jesus, about his exodus that will happen in Jerusalem. So it's, it's St. Luke's way of saying, as he then says more clearly at the end of the book of, of um, in Luke chapter 24, 
uh, did you not know from the scriptures? Did you not know from the from the law, the prophets, and the writings that the Messiah had to die and thus enter into his um, into his glory? And I remember that lecture of Father Anthony's because I think he made a signal point that's been largely forgotten in modern exegesis that and even theology that when Christ says everything has been written about me, everything has been said. Um, if Jesus reads the Old Testament to understand and know his own fate, how much more do we, being the members of his body, need to have the humility and the asu asuidity, <laughs> uh, the, the perseverance, um, to go back to that text and study to understand who Jesus is in his humanity, uh, also in the mystery of his divinity, and from there to understand the mystery of the church. Yes, because the entire mystery of the new people of God, which we call the church, is prefigured in the history of the old people of God. And I think this is exactly what the book of Revelation is teaching us. It's a key to the rereading of the Old Testament because it, it, um, it, I mean, it's marvelous. If you think that, if you ponder what it means that here's this book that one visionary saw and wrote St. John and somehow it's stuck onto the end of the of the entire collection of biblical books but no one but the Holy Spirit could have written this because it is the cornerstone to the entire Bible right it goes back to everything from the very beginning um, like it ends with this new paradisiacal Jerusalem so you have the combination of the paradise garden you have the the city of Babel turned into the city of Jerusalem at the very end. Babel is over to, for those who don't know, Babel is actually the exact same word as Babylon. So um, Genesis 11 could have could just as well be translated as Babylon, but for reasons I don't know, the rabbis always left it as Babel, but it's the exact same term. So you have Babel, Babylon destroyed, Jerusalem wins, everything returns into a big paradise. But the book of Revelation does this consistently with the language taken straight from the Old Testament. And it even, you know, even to the point that that um, the Old Testament plagues are reinterpreted in the light of the situation of the church, etc. So to answer your question, I think the book of Revelation teaches us a bit like St. Luke, how to read the Old Testament, always go back to the Old Testament, read it in light of the new and read the new in light of the old. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, maybe um, pivoting from these observations, we can turn and talk a little bit about the relation of the church to the world as it's portrayed in Revelation and how that, that helps us to live in the world here in the 21st century with all of its kind of wild complications. Um, <clears throat> so in the lecture, you were describing how there's a first wave of kind of bodily chastisements, and then there's a second wave of spiritual chastisements. And antecedent to that second wave, Christians are marked as such, and then they are spared those chastisements. And so there's a sense in which Christians in the world are already set apart. And so, like, the world doesn't touch them in the same way that it touches those of our contemporaries who have not the life of God within them. And I guess I was thinking about this kind of like against the backdrop, 20th century backdrop, you're thinking of this ongoing debate about what the church can give to the world and then what the church can learn from the world or receive from the world. And you have a lot of people weighing in in a variety of different ways, um, each, you know, each with their thoughts on the matter. Certainly there's a sense from kind of simple spiritual corners that if you don't love the world, you shouldn't preach to the world. So there's a, there's a suspicion of a kind of wholesale for like contempt for the world that if we're going to uh, be suspicious of it and critical of it, we have to do so with a, yeah, a heaping helping of Augustinian fear, but also with a genuine love for those who are not yet but could be part of the body of Christ. I was thinking about this recently because when St. Thomas talks about uh, capital grace in third part of the Summa, question eight, he talks about the kind of rank order of those who are in it, and he talks about those in heaven, and then those on earth in a state of grace, and those on earth not yet in a state of grace, but who will be in a state of grace, and then those on earth who are not yet but never will, etc. So there's a sense of, you know, there are members and then there are potential members and um, yeah, so maybe, maybe just based on your reading of the, the book of Revelation, what are some good ways in which we as 21st century Christians can approach the world um, 
both with, you know, like a healthy sense of like loving those of our contemporaries who are called to participate in the worship of the body of Christ, and then a healthy fear for some of its snares, something along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, of course, the first word that comes to my mind, not from the book of Revelation, but from the Gospel of John, is this much God has loved the world that he gave his only son. So if God so loves the world to give his only son, then uh, it's a non sequitur that Christians are called to love the world and following their Lord Jesus, give their life for the life of the world. And I think this is something that the book of Revelation very uh, strongly encourages us to do. And that is also why I called my talk Finding Consolation in the book of Revelation, because I find it so encouraging and powerful how the book of Revelation is telling us without any sugarcoating, yes, my dear Christians, you will have to suffer in this world. You are called to spill your blood in testimony for Jesus. But there is a purpose for it because by doing this, you're saving the world. So it's very simple. <laughs> it's The entire book is telling us a lot about suffering, but it kind of reminds me of what Jesus says in the gospel. Do not be afraid of those who can uh, who can kill the body but cannot cast your soul into hell, right? It's very, uh, I mean, we, we human beings, of course, we're tormented by fear because we love our bodies and we're afraid of pain. And probably much more so than earlier generations who were more trained in suffering pain. But as 21st century Christians, we're just so spoiled, we fear nothing more than pain and sickness as we've been experiencing these past couple of years. Um, and the book of Revelation is very, um, um, a little bit of a, uh, maybe a book for, for young boys who dream of being heroes, because it's, it's telling us that if we live our faith um, in a coherent way, um, we will suffer. And um, But, and this is what's beautiful and interesting, that it says this suffering will be an expression of love and it will be for the good of those whom you love. It's for the good of all the world. Um, there's this one passage in chapter 11 which to me, brings this home in a beautiful way because, um, you know, I talk about when uh, St. John is called to measure the church and then there's this moment when God allows the, the enemies of the church to invade the church and almost destroy it. The only thing they're not allowed to touch is the heart, the innermost being, the cult and the faith of the church. But e everyone who doesn't hold on to that, everybody who's not in the heart of that temple in the Jerusalem will be killed. And then they even kill these two prophets. But, but the result is afterwards that many, many come to the faith. And it's very clear that they receive the gift of the faith because of the martyrdom of those Christians who gave their life. And so um, as we are moving into a time in which society is becoming more and more hostile to Christians, obviously, no longer only in North Korea and China, but we see it both in Europe and in the United States uh, becoming more and more fierce. I, um, I think what this book is really teaching is, us is basically what St. Saint, Saint, uh, Paul also says, we are not fighting human beings, we are fighting um, the spiritual powers of the demons. And taking this back to the book of revelation the book of revelation shows us that eventually that ultimately we have it's the final battle between the one who duped our mother in the garden of eden and the children of god and so um what i find immensely important i mean for every for the time of every christian jesus teaches us that in the gospel and it's it's one of his most important points love your enemies um, learn to suffer and give testimony for love of those who oppose you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's as, as chastening as it is humbling, which is a terrible combination. Um, as, as you were talking, so I'm, I'm thinking about the Lord's providence and you describe how it's not just you know, it's not, it's not being spared suffering or it's not being indulged in our especially 
feckless and fretful fear of pain and suffering, but it's rather, um, you know, to have a, a clear sense of the God who permits it, right? The God whose will we can discover in the midst of it, or in a certain sense, like we as Christians have a particular grace whereby reality is more transparent to our gaze, to our baptized gaze, so that we can see the work of God at work within and we see how it redounds to glory. What are ways in which, you know, so you spoke about the past few years, certainly in light of the pandemic, you know, like the war, Russia and Ukraine, thinking about, um, you know, the kind of post-road dispensation and the threat of violence or the visitation of violence and things like that. So people are thinking a lot of, a lot about these matters um, and just trying to kind of plunge into the providence of God. Maybe what are some resources, um, in addition to things that you've already mentioned, but resources in the book of Revelation that help us better to be abandoned to the will of God or help us better to consent to the will of God as it is made manifest in the context of, yeah, troubled times? Um, well, I'm not sure I can add anything to what I said, but um, <laughs> what I just, what always strikes me is how in one of the seven letters, the Lord says uh, to that particular church, do not be afraid of what you will yet have to suffer. Um, I often think of that phrase because, again, it's the Lord saying, do not be afraid of what you will yet have to suffer. And then he says, the devil will throw some of you into prison. And um, I mean, if we look at the life of Jesus himself and all the apostles, we have to come to terms with it that... Um, this is actually what happens to faithful apostles. Um, I mean, we've been spoiled for centuries, or at least my ancestors have been. No, not no. I mean, under the Nazis, my ancestors were certainly thrown into prison. But um, yeah, our generation has been spoiled to um, pay a very little price for our faith, and um, and this might not remain such. Um, what consoled me so much in reading the Book of Revelation is to see that. Uh, you know, in the symbolic way, when Jesus receives the the book of life and he holds it in his hand, and this is telling us he, he all the power in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And that's something we forget because in the midst of this chaos, we are like, oh, um, where is God? And maybe I didn't pray enough. He's far away. He doesn't see me, whatever. No, everything that happens to me is known to him not a hair falls from my head without him knowing it, right? So I think what we do have to uh, rediscover is not only the positive will of God and his providence, as we're used to thinking, oh, and this, this happened in my life, and then God, I believe, yes, God sent me this donor who paid for my car or whatever. Um, but, 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 but we're very bad at recognizing, but in also embracing um, the passive will of God, which is also his will if he allows a, 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 a pandemic, well, then our reaction should be, Lord, I praise and thank you in the midst of this suffering that I do not understand. And, and know that whatever the Lord is allowing to happen, he will ordain it for our good. There's not a thing. I mean, St. Catherine even says that once we repent of our sins, they will be for our salvation. Like, there's nothing that can happen in the life of a Christian if he is in the state of grace that will not work for my salvation and for the good of the world. And so my, my resource would be to say, well, go back to the book and um, meditate it and meditate it and meditate it and see why God is allowing these chastisements and what for. And particularly also not forget to meditate on these interim moments in the book where we again and again get this glimpse into heaven and the Lord is showing us this life is not your final destination. You are destined for glory. You're destined for life with me. I will give you a share in the tree of life. Um, I mean, d don't you find it surprising? It always baffles me in my own life, but also in Christianity as a whole, how, how we hold on to this life as if God had promised us paradise on this earth. And the book of Revelation is very clear. Our final destination is not here. We are in the desert like the people of Israel. And uh, well, we're actually, according to the book of Revelation, we're in a constant process of an exodus in which plagues are hitting left and right. Um, 
helping us to leave this country and enter into God's kingdom. Um, yeah, just by way of follow-up to that, I think often of the fact that, yeah, sometimes we comport ourselves as if, you know, like the care, the concern, the solicitude, the worry, the anxiety that we feel about, um, you know, our destiny, how things will turn out is the most powerful cause thereof. It's like, it's up to me, it's up to me, it's up to me. So I have to work, I have to worry, I have to think as if it were up to me, up to me. But I think one of the things that comes through in reading the book of Revelation is that God desires our destiny and its fulfillment with much greater efficacy. And the way in which that's made manifest and communicable is through a kind of like rehearsal of the Mirabilia Dei. You know, it's just like marvel after marvel after marvel. And then those are used as a way by which to kind of bring back before our mind's eye the marvels that have gone before us. There's a line, I think it's, maybe it's addressed, well, I've forgotten which church it's addressed to, so I won't embarrass myself by making up a church. I do remember that the Church of Philadelphia is mentioned. And although it's in Asia Minor, I still take pride in the Philadelphia and Pennsylvania since it gets such honorable mention. But maybe it's the Church of Ephesus that's told, like, you've forgotten the love that you had at first. And I think this, the way in which, uh, like, recollection and then love are combined in this commendation of the fact, like, you have what you need. You need only, like, return to that love, and it becomes a new or a fresh, like, a source um, yeah, of everlasting life, or it, or it plunges you, you like more deeply into that everlasting life, which is already at work in your midst. Um, so yeah, when I'm not kind of getting caught up on like insects with men's faces in the book of Revelation, which uh, certainly interests me to no end, it's those things which, which afford me a great consolation. But we are nearing the end of our time together, so I thought that for, uh, for, a, final, yeah, for a final question, we might just think a little bit about how we as Christians in the 21st century maybe chasten some of our apocalyptic prognostications. So we both made mention of the fact that things in the 21st century are, you know, they can be difficult. Whether they're more difficult than in past ages, not so clear, but, you know, they're difficult. And I think that there's a certain temptation uh, to say things are as bad as they've ever been, and maybe Jesus is going to come back tomorrow so I probably don't need to finish my dissertation because what's the sense? Because he'll certainly be here before February. Um, so what, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think are some good ways, you know, on the basis of the book of Revelation that we can chasten some of our foolish apocalyptic prognostications and then live, yeah, a healthier, more Christian sensibility when it comes to uh, the coming of our Lord at the end of the age? Yeah, well, I, I guess I already spoke to that in an earlier question that I think... Um, well, number one, you said in a private conversation, and that's key. Um, we live in the end times since ever since the Acts of the Apostles. Um, that term shows up in the Acts of the Apostles, and it says clearly the end times have started with the coming of Christ because in the moment that God became man, time is no longer time in the same way it was before. Uh, and so we are living in, an, in the end time. The Lord is not telling us when he is going to return. Um, yes. There is a progression um, towards the coming of the Lord. I mean, the, the New Testament is also clear about that. I and mean, Jesus himself says, will the Son of Man find faith when he returns to earth? So it's clear that apostasy on a massive scale, and now we even have bishops apostatizing, at least in my home country, um, is a sign of, of something <laughs> of the Lord. Of course, I mean, he's already 2,000 years closer than he was 2,000 years ago, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but we don't know how massive... Um, uh, if there'll be a total apostasy and it'll be like in the Lord of the world that there's only one person left. You know, the Lord's not showing us. He's just asking the question, will the Son of Man find faith when he returns? So we do have massive signs of of really apocalyptic times, but then um, the church has always been living in apocalyptic times. I mean, this was written for an ap apocalyptic time at the end of the first century. That's how they experienced it. And um, for me, a great lesson is your saint, the order of your glorious, the glorious saint of your glorious order, St. Vincent's Ferrer, right? He was convinced that the Lord would return in his own time. And that's what made him a saint because it really gave him the energy or the, the parousia, the, you know, the, the, 
the love of Christ was urging him to preach the gospel to everybody because he was so conscious of this being the end times. And, uh, and the Lord speaks in a similar way. So if it helps you, well, yeah, then think that the Lord comes back tomorrow. But that should not be stopping us from writing our dissertations or whatever it is, because if the Lord returned tomorrow, he'd be saying, well, Nina, why were you not writing your dissertation yesterday? That is what I have been ordaining you to do. This is how you were supposed to, supposed to save souls. Instead, you were sitting on your couch and reading Tolkien. No, that's not what I was asking you to do, right? Or <laughs> that would be a good thing. <laughs> you were just watching YouTube. <laughs> um, so, so... Um, um, uh, it's a, it's an ambiguous thing. I think it's healthy for us and the Lord wants us to think that we are in the end times and we are in the end times. Maybe it can be a consolation to us or it is a consolation to me that um, both St. Paul and the book of Revelation seem to see, and it makes sense, right? Um, in chapter 12, it says the devil went to make war against the children of the woman, which is Mary and the church, and those who keep hold fast the testimony to Jesus Christ. And then it says, and he knew that his time was but short. Revelation 12, 12. He, knews, he knows he has but a short time. So it's clear the devil knows when his game is over. And the closer the Lord approaches, the more fierce he will fight against God's people, because that's the only way he can hurt God by hurting his children. But we also see, and I think maybe this is now a bit of a Catholic um, uh, uh, I, I do think we're justified to see a correspondence between Our Lady's massive interventions in the history of the Church ever since Guadalupe um, and, and the time we're living in, in which Mary plays a role that is much more pronounced than it was in the first 1500 centuries of the church. Um, and that in this moment where the dragon of old, the book of Revelation is very clear in identifying um, Satan with the dragon, the serpent in the garden, and all these, the Leviathan, all the different names, the enemy of God and God's people gets in the Old Testament. Um, that in this uh, that that we're facing the final battle between the dragon and the woman. And that is something we get straight from Genesis 3.15. We see it in scriptures and it, it is in accord with our own times in which we've had a, a pope like John Paul II whom, who really put uh, the Marian devotion in the center of the church's devotion and, and a deeper. we are in a time in which we're coming to a deeper understanding of the role that the mother of God plays in the economy of salvation. And so um, I think all we need to know is that, okay, this is, I am living in a special time. I'm living in especially Marian time. She is given to us as the Ark of Noah to take our refuge in from the deluge that is coming. Um, she is where I'm supposed to be when the, when the dragon attacks. Uh, she is my only refuge. And by being taking my refuge into her immaculate heart, I'm actually taking my refuge into the heart of the church. If I live a life in the sacraments, if I'm vigilant, which means I'm a person of prayer, I do my daily duty as a Christian, then I am where I'm supposed to be. And then it doesn't really matter whether the Lord returns tonight or in 2,000 years or 10,000 years. That's wonderful. And I love how with each question, uh, you answered with a kind of, um, typical modesty or simplicity. Like, I don't know if I have much to add on this theme. I think I may have said it all with the last question, but then you add wonderful things. So thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for joining. Thanks so much for taking the time. Very grateful. Thank you for having me. It was a joy to speak with you. <laughs> yeah. And maybe by way of, um, yeah, by way of parting thought, are there ways in which people can follow up with you, with your work? I don't know if you have an academia.edu page or a particular place where people can look for yeah, things that you've published or, or lectures that you've given? Yes, I do have an EDU, uh, Academia EDU page, um, but that is mostly uh, undigestible academic uh, contributions <laughs> on the Song of Songs. Um, um, I, I do have a YouTube channel, but I have to say it's all in German um, because I feel so privileged to be in the United States that I also feel urged to give back what I receive here 
to my fellow Christians in Germany. There is many, many good Catholics in Germany. Um, and so we try to support each other. And this is my way of paying back and serving my home country and my home church, which I love very much. So maybe maybe on the YouTube channel, which has the funny name of mini cut, which is a derivation of you cut, but it became a, sm a small cut because it was only five minutes in the beginning. Um, some people tell me you can turn on the translation, um, but, uh, you know, that doesn't Sometimes it's very astounding what the YouTube makes me to say. Google Translate makes me say. So I'm not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> no, that's that's a great service. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with people here in Europe, and they'll often say things to the effect of like, "Oh yeah, you know, there's not too much need for resources creating resources here in whatever country it is, Belgium or the Netherlands or Switzerland, because there's so many things available in other settings. You know, like stuff that's coming from America." But I always insist it's super important to hear the word of God preached in your mother tongue because the Lord speaks to you with the same voice that your mother speaks to you. So I think that's such a great, yeah, that's such a great gift. That's such a great service. Well, that's a great encouragement because I do often think um, so much is available in English. We don't need more voices in English. But it's also true that um, the many, many, the younger Germans, they all follow the English um, speaking podcast. And I know many who are surviving on your podcast um, Father Michael Schmitz and those kind of podcasts. Um, but yeah, there's also the older people who also uh, are th hungry for the <laughs> word of God and, and they only speak German. Yeah. Aber das ist schon <laughs> wichtig. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much again. And uh, thanks so much to our listeners who have tuned in for this episode. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the Thomistic Institute podcast on your podcast app or on YouTube. And if you haven't yet, please do check out ThomisticInstitute.org, where you can find out information for other future lectures, conferences, intellectual retreats, events where we hope to meet you in person, and then to deepen the friendships which we've begun online. So know that uh, our prayers are for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast. Cheers. Cheers.